Hi hey guys, BuildZoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the voltage regulators on the EVGA Z390 Dark motherboard. Um, and, you know, I've already covered all of the features uh, of this motherboard in the last video, so let's just get right into it, because this is still going to be a long one. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair One i140 Compact Gaming PC. The Corsair One i140 is a small form factor PC outfitted with a 9700K, RTX 2080, 32GB of RAM, and a 480GB NVMe SSD, all housed within a 2mm thick aluminum chassis. The Corsair One i140 is a 12 liter system fit for desktop use with the same sized i160 counterpart with higher end parts. Learn more at the link in the description below. Starting off with the most important and largest voltage regulator on the board, um, say hello to the 12-phase vCore VRM off of an X299 Dark. Um, because, well, it, it's not actually the same. They, they've changed it quite a bit. It has a different layout, different inductors, but the power components themselves are actually very similar. But anyway, that's our vCore VRM right here. Uh, then over here we have one phase of VCCIO. So that's our VCCIO over there. Then up here we have uh, iGPU power, which is kind of an interesting inclusion because like the FTW from EVGA, as far as I'm aware, does not actually have an iGPU VRM at all. So yeah, if you want to run your iGPU, this board can, the FTW can't, which is kind of an interesting, and I did, th I did this mistake twice, that's SA. Sorry, that's system agent down there. This is VCCIO. I don't know why I keep mixing that up. It like I previous take, I made this exact mistake. I was like, okay, I'll just restart it, and, and I won't make that mistake anyway. So that's our main uh, voltage regulators around the CPU socket. Pretty standard layout here. Um, well, actually, it's not completely standard because they move the VCCIO up here, but um, the the reasoning for that is very simple. You need two different voltage controllers because of how many different voltage like VRMs you have here, right? You have your VCCIO, VGPU. Um, so you need a controller for those two, and then you need another controller for vCore and VCCSA. So. As I said earlier, vCore is a 12-phase VRM, and as we all know, nobody makes a 12-phase voltage controller. They only go up to 10 phases as of right now, and so EVGA is, of course, using doublers to achieve the higher phase count. The doublers used are the ISL uh, 6617s, and these are a really cool doubler. Uh, and the reasoning for that, for them being really, really cool, is this is one of the few doublers, if not the only doubler, that I'm aware of that does proper current balancing. Um, so essentially what that means is this chip has enough circuit, like has enough logic in it to monitor the current going through this phase and this phase. And then if one of them is pushing, let's say you end up in a scenario where this one's pushing 20 amps and this one's pushing 40 amps. Well, that's not ideal for your VRM efficiency, which considering this is a 12 phase that you're not actually going to see that. But um, anyway, just example, you know, just as an example. So let's say you're pushing 20 amps through one and 40 amps through the other phase. Well, this is not optimal for your VRM efficiency and it's not optimal for like VRM thermals because this power stage will end up getting a bit hotter as a result. And ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's imperfect. So what the doubler actually does is it monitors the current through this phase and this phase as well. And when it sees this kind of current imbalance, it will actually extend the PWM signal going into this phase which is really, really cool because like the next current balancing method that doublers use that I'm aware of is they literally just skip, like what they would do is they would skip the PWM pulse for this one. So basically you'd get two pulses uh, into the lower current output phase. And the issue with that is it tends to um, actually like put, just, like it doesn't achieve balance. What it does is it makes the imbalance in the opposite direction. So instead of like you end up with 20 amps going through the lower phase and 40 going through the upper phase. So this doubler can actually avoid that and that gives you better uh, efficiency because you actually spread your loading across the entire VRM very, very uniformly. And then uh, the ISL6617, of course, reports the uh, combined current of these two phases together to the actual voltage controller over here, which is the ISL69138, uh, um, which is running in uh, 6 plus 1 phase mode. And the plus one is, of course, being run into the VCCSA down there. So, yeah, we have our six, you know, six phases from the ISL. That goes into our doublers. The doublers spit out two uh, independent PWM signals. So, 
that's what's going on in terms of control. Now, the, the doublers, like, yes, they boost your efficiency. They also improve, like, that's the main thing. They boost your efficiency. They also reduce your output ripple because you do actually get, like, a 12-phase a uh, VRM, essentially, by doing this. Uh, there is one downside to them. They do put a bit of delay onto your PWM signals, so you will have... Uh, it, it basically makes it more difficult to achieve certain levels of transient uh, response performance because your PWM signals are going to be a bit slow, uh, are going to be a bit delayed. So, um, but an interesting thing about EVGA's motherboards is that they really like to use very low inductance inductors. And this is kind of interesting because basically the trade-offs for low inductance on your inductors is lower inductance, better transient response. So basically th this is like... You, you get better transient response with your lower inductance. The downside is that you get higher output ripple and you also lose efficiency. But if you, you know, design your VRM like correctly, you can basically balance out all of the negatives of your inductors because the impact they have on efficiency is actually really, really minor. So the, the doublers can kind of take care of that. And the output ripple, well, we're interleaving 12 of the damn things. You could have a pretty, like, one of these can have a pretty bad voltage waveform, but when you properly interleave, every, like, 12 of them, at that point, it stops being an issue. So the doublers kind of eliminate any, uh, have the ability to potentially eliminate any issues you would have with output ripple caused by very low inductances. So... That's kind of an interesting thing where, like, EVGA is using 150 nanohenries, whereas, say, Asus, uh, so Asus is doing something weird where they have their phase, like, they, well, they have their power stages and inductors running in parallel. So the inductors themselves are rated for, like, 400 nanohenries, but since they're in parallel, they're effectively 200. Um, when you see motherboards that have, like, faked phases, those inductors are also in parallel, and they're usually rated at around 400 nanohenries and effectively therefore become 200 because they're in parallel. Uh, Gigabyte likes to run 300 nanohenries. MSI tends to run around 220 um, when they're using like one induct, like when they have separate phases. So um, yeah, that's it's kind of interesting that EVGA basically has 50 nanohenries less than all the other board vendors. It is worth noting that, for example, on uh, GPUs, it's actually pretty standard practice to use inductor values of below 200 nanohenries um, mostly because GPUs have such very, um, well, they're, they're, the power consumption of a GPU is really not uh, consistent. So you end up with massive transient, like basically transient response becomes extremely important. And so voltage regulators on GPUs tend to opt for lower inductance inductors just to sort of, um, you know, component, well, basically to deal with the uh, inconsistent loading that they end up, uh, end up under. Anyway, so that's kind of the, the control scheme here. Ultimately, can we make a judgment from this? Not really. You'd need an oscilloscope to actually measure uh, how much of an impact all of EVGA's sort of control and uh, output <laughs> inductance uh, decisions have made. Now, what we don't need to use an oscilloscope for is to figure out the efficiency. Um, and on this VRM, it is absolutely ridiculous. This is the same 12 phase they had on the X299 Dark uh, in terms of the power stages and phase count. And uh, the power stages are therefore the ISL 9922-7Bs. Um, these are 60 amp smart power stages. Um, more, and actually these are thermally enhanced smart power stages. So, and they're extra compact. So these are like really, really special and really, really expensive. They're like $5 a piece. Um, so yeah, there, there's a good, you know, well, there's more than 60, there's, <laughs> there's like 60, now, uh, what, so we have 60 in the V-Core, we have another 10 there and a 5 over there, so we have like $75 worth of power stages on this motherboard. Um, EVGA has, you know, just kind of blown a good chunk of the budget on just that. Um, but hey, uh, the end result is that this thing gets some of the best efficiency out of, like, this is the most efficient 12 phase on Z390, and it's almost the most efficient, uh, VR most efficient VRM on Z390 period. Um, it just kind of depends on what kind of load you're running. Anyway, so as for the thermal enhancement part, well, this metal tab on these um, is literally directly connected into the, the actual silicon of the power stage. And that basically means that these things have a very low thermal resistance, which means they're very good at cooling themselves um, through heat sinks or really just through ambient air because their case uh, their casing material is not as much of an insulator as what you normally get. 
Um, the end result is that if you actually measure the operating temperature of these power stages like on, on this metal tab, and they're not putting out a significant amount of heat per, per phase, like if you're pushing like say one watt on one of these, the temperature difference between the temperature on the tab and the temperature inside the power stage is going to be like 0.5 degrees Celsius. So essentially, if you measure the temperature of one of these from the top of it, you're measuring the internal temperature. Almost, right? Whereas with a lot of other power stages, you would make that same measurement and the temperature difference for, for one watt can be anything from three degrees to say seven, right? If, if you're like especially terrible. So very, very low thermal resistance on these. And basically they're, they're great at cooling themselves. So uh, yeah, EVGA has opted for these. And you know what? The, just, just the fact that the power stages are like thermally enhanced and really good at dumping heat was not enough for EVGA. You may have noticed that this board is gold plated, freaking everywhere. And a lot of that <laughs> is because EVGA decided that, you know what, the, it's, it's not enough that we have probably the most efficient 12 phase on Z390. Um, no, it also has to like be completely capable of cooling itself without a heat sink. So you have this, these basically metal strips right here, which are actually exposed ground plane um, all of the VRM. So, you know, that cooling. Free cooling right there for, for the power stages again. And then, of course, they, they have the screw holes just plated more. And then the outer edge of the PCB is also just gold plated like that. So essentially, the PCB itself um, is upgraded into sort of being more of a heat sink than the PCB normally is. So that's what that's what's going on with all of the gold plating that EVGA has on here. Um, Anyway, at this point, you're probably wondering, okay, so this VRM is really good at dumping heat. Um, it has very expensive power stages. How efficient is it? Um, very, very efficient. So uh, operating parameters for this VRM are going to be 1.35 volts output, um, 500 kilohertz switching frequency, and 5 volts drive voltage, because these don't actually run on anything other than, uh, other than 5 volts anyway, and that's a terrible 5. There, much better. So 5 volts drive voltage, uh, 500 kilohertz switching frequency. And that is per power stage. So that's like 1 megahertz at the controller, right? Because the doublers cut that switching frequency in half. So 1 megahertz at the controller, 500 kilohertz on the power stage. Um, so with these operating parameters on this VRM, it will produce, it is, it is capable of pushing 100 amps output at only 10 watts of heat dissipation. It doesn't need a heatsink <laughs> at this kind of at this kind of load. It really doesn't need a heatsink. Um, and interestingly enough, this is actually if you look at the efficiency curve for a standard power stage, like say the ISL 9922-7B. Um, unfortunately, that falls in the. Normally, the curves look like that. That falls into this part. So this is actually like, honestly, if the board is pushing less than 100 amps, assuming EVGA has the voltage controller properly configured, it shouldn't even run all 12 phases if you're pushing only 100 amps. It should probably run like 10 or 8 phases max because pushing all 12 phases um, for a 100 amp load is actually less than optimal efficiency um, at this point. But anyway, uh, moving on to a higher load. So this is like the upper limits of what a 9900K can do before it becomes completely uncoolable. Well, uh, can do in terms of sort of ambient cooling methods. And already for this, you're going to be looking at like delitted CPU with potentially like a direct die frame. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to achieve this kind of current draw, uh, on the stock uh, Intel uh, soldering because the solder just doesn't, like, it's not good enough at thermal transfer to do that. Um, anyway, at 200 amps output, this VRM is only going to produce about 18 watts of heat. So that's what I said about, you know, we're, we're moving up on the efficiency curve. So the, this, the, the ratio of current to heat output is better here than, at you know, there. Um, anyway, moving past 200 amps, uh, going into the 300 amp territory, we actually start getting into, like, actually, the interesting thing is this 12 phase hits peak efficiency pretty much at 1200, uh, at 200 amps uh, output. So it's pretty much, like, optimized for running uh, a 9900K as far as I'm concerned, and without a heatsink, mind you, which, uh, like, you know, EVGA has a very elaborate cooling system on this motherboard, but I think this board looks really, really good without <laughs> anything on it. <laughs> So, quite frankly, well, you might need, you might still want the chipset heatsink because that thing looks horrendous. But uh, 
you know, if, if you'd like to admire your VRM while the board is running in your system, especially if you have like a, a side panel window, um, which putting this board in a case is not the correct use for it. But, you know, if you do, do go that way, um, you can actually run it without the heatsink and it's going to be fine. And you can stare at your very expensive power stages. These power stages probably, like three of these probably cost more than the heat sinks on top of them. So anyway, moving on. Uh, the 300 amps output, you're going to be looking at about uh, 30 watts of heat. So now we're back at that part of the efficiency curve that's on par with that. Uh, like the efficiency is back at to the levels of like the 100 amps output. And then going up to 400 amps, uh, you're going to be looking at about 47 watts of heat. And then finally 500 amps, which is like, like honestly, liquid nitrogen is going to top out around 300 amps. It's not even going to reach 400 amps, but you know, this is a crazy 12 phase. So for... Theor for theory's sake, 500 amps, what would happen? Well, it would produce about 66 watts of heat. And interestingly enough, EVGA rates this VRM, um, well, they, they spec the board's power delivery system for about 800 watts, which tells us that they probably have, a like, the cooling system on this motherboard as, it's like, as it ships is designed probably for around 50 watts of heat dissipation, because 800 watts at 1.35 volts is somewhere between that 400 and 500 amp figure. Um... So, yeah, um, you know, this this VRM is absolutely massive overkill for a, uh, well, I, I wouldn't, like, it's peak efficiency, right? It nails that peak efficiency. So that's re really nice for, for these given power stages. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, nice uh, VRM. Um, like, it is technically ridiculous overkill. Like, there's nothing, so if you had better heat, like, if you have heat sinks on these, then there's nothing stopping you at running, like, there on the efficiency curve, right? But uh, still, it, it's, like, a good choice. Like, I feel like EVGA didn't do the, like, because there's a couple Z390 motherboards out there, which technically, at the higher current loads, can do better, like, the, the 300 amps, 400 amps, and 500 amp figures. There's Z390 boards that can handle those loads better than the dark. The thing is, at that point, you're actually going to be like disabling huge chunks of their voltage regulators to maintain decent efficiency below 200 amps, um, which this one kind of like they shouldn't have to do that until around like 100. So, you know, EV EVGA has basically like not done the silly thing because they could have like there's enough space here to put a 16 phase if they felt like it. It just wouldn't be even remotely practical to do. And also the ISL 99, uh, 69138 doesn't actually support that. They could have gone for a 14 where they'd have like a 7 plus 0 setup and then another controller. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, th this is like a really good fit for a 9900K in terms of power delivery. Um, definitely kind of excessive but not to say the extent of some of the other Z390 boards out there. So let's talk about some other Z390 boards. For comparison's sake, um, I've pulled up my note, uh, well, pulled up the numbers for like the Asus 5 phase that Asus has on the uh, Maximus 11 Extreme as well as the Maximus 11 Gene. Um, and that that VRM at 200 amps output gets about 21.5 watts of uh, heat dissipation. So it technically could still run without a heat sink, but considering that it has um, less, like that VRM is more compact than this one, it has less inherent capability to cool itself uh, it doesn't use doublers, so it's a like, well, actually, that wouldn't impact it unless you crank up the switching frequency really high, which you can do in the in the BIOS settings. But anyway, so, you know, th this is more efficient than like the VRM you get on a Maximus 11 Extreme or a Maximus 11 Gene. Um, excessive, like, honestly, as, as I've said, like, it's a bit excessive still, but... Um, it is worth pointing out that it is more efficient at 300 amps. The the gene, you know, the, well, I like to call it the Asus Five phase because that's what it is. Uh, would do about 36 watts, and at 400 amps, it would do about 58 watts. And that's by no means like I don't consider that a bad VRM. It's just like um, it, it's a good five phase, right? You wouldn't really get a five phase that does better than that. It's just like it's still a five phase, and uh, it is less efficient than this. And then for ridiculous mode. Uh, Gigabyte's uh, Z390 Extreme Board and MSI's Z390 Godlike. So both of those use a 16-phase VRM using international rectifier components, so they don't have current balancing doublers whatsoever. But there's so many phases in there that from basically 200 amps up, they actually have an efficiency advantage, at least if the phase shedding works properly. Um, at 200 amps, those boards, the sort of like the MSI and the Gigabyte board, the, the top end MSI and Gigabyte boards would do 16 watts for the, the 200 amps, uh, 24 watts at 300 amps. 
Uh, and that's if they shed the phases. So that would be running in 12 phase mode. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that like I told Gigabyte, like, why didn't you go for a 12 phase? Like, honestly, under normal loading, this thing is going to have like th this thing is wasting power running ex an another four phases that the like you're not peaking efficiency at. Because, um, yeah, that that 16 watts is assuming they would be hitting the efficiency. If they weren't, then it would actually get worse efficiency. Um, but anyway, going up to 400 amps, uh, the Gigabyte board would only produce about uh, Gigabyte or MSI Z390 God, a Gigabyte Extreme Z390 Godlike from MSI would do about 34 watts. Um, so yeah, that VRM is impractical levels of overkill. This is what I consider practical levels of overkill. Th this is also like, like acceptable in my opinion. I still think Asus should have, like the controller they used could have gone to a six phase. And it wouldn't have really, like, it would have taken up more space on the board, but it wouldn't have really had any other negative impacts. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure why they're, like, especially on such expensive boards, too. But anyway, it's not like it's a disaster, but uh, I, I really like this VRM. Ultimately, um, I don't think this is, like, a huge design win over the other board vendors, but it is a really, really nice uh, VRM, and it, it is, like, well thought out. Anyway, moving on to... Um, the system agent VRM, as well as the VCCIO, they're both single phase. Um, this one's, of course, hanging off of the 69138 here, and it uses an ISL uh, 99, what, it, wait, no, 99140, yes. So it uses a 99140, which is just a regular power stage capable of 40 amps output. And um, yeah, um, I mean, system agent doesn't really pull much, like, System Agent doesn't pull a whole lot of current ever, so this is actually perfectly adequate for, for powering the System Agent. Absolutely no problem with that. Um, in fact, it's rather overkill. Um, you, quite frankly, wouldn't need a heatsink on, like, th this, this, if they didn't put it under the VRM heatsink that the vCore VRM sh has, it, like, it doesn't need its own one. Um, like, if they move this phase up here or something. Um, so anyway, and this is actually nicer than a lot of the VCCS AVRMs you find on a lot of other boards. But again, this is like, th this is impractical levels of overkill. Because um, the other boards also don't even need heat sinks. Because System Agent just pulls so little power compared to a lot of, it, like, compared to vCore or anything like that. VCCIO, same situation. VCCIO pu pushes even, like, the, the IO pulls even less power than the... Uh, system agent so th this is even more overkill because that's again the same ISL 99140 uh, there um, except the VCCIO is controlled by this controller right here which is also controlling the VGPU and that is an ISL uh, 69 69133 and that's a four phase um, running in two plus one phase mode so you do get a two phase IGPU power and for IGPU power I the EVGA is using again the ISL 992, uh, 9922.7Bs, which are ridiculous overkill for, you know, IGPU power. So there's two phases of that as well. Another interesting thing to note about the, the VRM on the Z390 Dark here is actually EVGA has opted for all tantalum output filter, like bulk uh, output filtering capacitors. Um, which uh, I'm not sure how much of an impact that has. These are generally more expensive than your conventional like aluminum polymers like that. Um, and we used to see these a lot on motherboards in the past. Like they were a pretty big deal. Like Gigabyte had boards with them. MSI had boards with them. And they'd like advertise it pretty heavily that, hey, we're using all tantalum capacitors. But uh, I think more recently, the aluminum polymers have probably just mostly caught up in uh, like efficiency and performance to these. So these days you just see aluminum polymers everywhere instead of anybody going for these. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting decision from EVGA to go for these because uh, they do have slightly, uh, well, they have not necessarily better ESR, but they may have like better ESL. Well, ESL would definitely be better on these just because of the packaging they're in. Uh, compared to your aluminum polymers, but ultimately that's one of those things where, again, you'd need an oscilloscope to check if these make much of a difference, if any at all. Um, but they are, like, it's an interesting design uh, choice by EVGA. Um, moving up top, uh, memory power is provided by yet another ISL, uh, <laughs> ISL uh, uh, 9922.7b, this is like ridiculous overkill for memory power. Interestingly enough, um, EVGA goes for like the single phase memory power, whereas a lot of other board vendors go for like two phase memory power. 
Um, like Asus and Azrock really like to go for two phase memory power. Uh, ultimately, um, you know, you can compensate for low phase count with output filtering. And uh, I've hinted at this in the features video, EVGA's output filtering is rather elaborate for the memory power here. So, you know, I, I think essentially they decided like we can set the switching frequency on this really high because ultimately it doesn't need to push a lot of power in the first place. Um, or I, DDR4 barely pull, like DDR4 really doesn't pull much power whatsoever. Um, so we can, they can set the switching frequency really, really high to con compensate potentially for the low phase count. And then they really do have a rather elaborate output filtering system. So, um, I don't think this is like, like, I guess it's just like a design style choice more than like a practical decision there where EVGA is like, we're going to run one phase and a lot of the, like ASRock and Asus like to do two phase, but MSI, I think likes to go one phase as well. And Gigabyte never, uh, Gigabyte likes to do single phase memory power as well. More recently in the past, we saw some boards go all the way up to three phase memory power, but that was the same kind of logic that, you know, br brings you the, the 16 phase that needs to turn off four phases in order to hit peak efficiency at 200 amps. It's, it's essentially just smacking on phases for the sake of having phases, which uh, <laughs> not exactly, uh, you know, a great way to design things. Anyway, the memory is controlled by yet another ISL69133, um, except that's running in just like one plus zero mode because there's one phase on it. So that is the voltage regulators on the EVGA Z390 Dark. Um, I'm, I'm a, like... You know, it's not my like. It's not anything uh, my well mind blowing. I think um, compared to like some of the other things that EVGA has done here, right? This is a very similar uh, VRM as to what they used on the X299 Dark um, in terms of the V core. Then they've just kind of added phases for the extra rails that are necessary. In fact, they didn't even add phases. Like VCCIO and VCCSA was also present on the on the Dark, so that's that's not new. Um, and just basically the iGPU power is new. The memory VRM is actually, again, like they had the same, uh, you know, 60 amp power stage for memory power on the dark. And it was also a single phase, well, for each set of dim slots. Um, and that one just had like, that one didn't have quite as elaborate of an output filtering setup. So yeah, um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the VRM configuration here on the, uh, um, uh, on the Z390 dark, um, it's just like, it is very, it's a very expensive VRM, right? It's also very, very efficient. One of the, actually, I think it's probably like the, like it's second most efficient, well, it depends on, you know, the phase shedding there, but ultimately it's like the second most efficient, definitely one of the most efficient VRMs uh, on Z390 in general. But right now, as far as I'm aware, it's about second um, for the 200 amp figure. And then, well, at the higher currents, definitely it's not, not the top, but you shouldn't really, like, you don't need to worry about the higher currents because basically 200 amps plot, like anything above 200 amps is very much sub-zero cooling territory. Um, and at that point, you know, you're probably not going to be running the, the, whatever workload you're running is not going to be running that long. Um, so then you can just kind of rely on the VR, like it takes so, like, well, the benefit to having all the efficiency is that, of course, it takes so long for the VRM to overheat that you don't need to have heat sinks on it, um, even when pushing very, very high currents like that 300 or 400 amps, which if you're running on liquid nitrogen, the other thing that happens is ultimately the board freezes over and not having to run heat sinks on the board does mean that you can just have insulation freaking everywhere. Um, instead of worrying about, you know, water building up between uh, water potentially building up on the power stages, which would actually really, really suck with these because there's a great big like that exposed drain is a great big 12 volt tab right there. And if that shorts to anything, really, uh, yeah, you're going to have a bad day. Um, well, actually, no, that's the that tab right there is the the no the switch node of the phase. So it's not, well, occasionally it's at 12 volts. Other times it's a like VRM output voltage. So yeah, like you still don't want that shorting to ground at, like at all. So, you know, that, that that's kind of that. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it, like after the X299 Dark, this is kind of what I expected, you know, it, it's more of the same. And that's, that's definitely not a bad thing. Um, and except this does actually go more elaborate on the cooling system. Right. Like the, the like they they I feel like they've really made better use of all the gold plating they gone for, because on the dark, it really like it does not use that much. Uh, it kind of feels more like an aesthetics thing there. But here I, I like 
there. <laughs> Back of the board acts as its own heatsink, um, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, that is it for the uh, Z390 Dark uh, VRM overview. And uh, I guess thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support Gamers Nexus, there's store.gamersnexus.net. Uh, store.gamersnexus.net. Yes, I do remember it correctly. Uh, where you can pick up things like the like the Gamers Nexus mod mat that you can see in the background. Um, and uh, or if you, or, well, there's also shirts and other things and like other merch. And if you don't want to buy anything, there's also the Gamers Nexus Patreon. And yeah, uh, so that's that. And if you'd like to see more content from me, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking, where I do a lot of overclocking stuff. Um, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.